Welcome to another edition of Reaching Out. I'm Gregory Floyd, President of Local 237 Teamsters. With us, our very special guest, once again, is State New York State Controller Tom DiNapoli. Tom, Mr. Controller, welcome back to Reaching Out. Greg, it's great to be back with you. Thank you for your wonderful leadership of a very important union, Local 237. You represent so many, I mean, it was about 24,000 members, I think, if I remember yes. my numbers correctly, yeah. and so many different job titles, men and women who really do incredible work for New York City and uh, so many of our communities on Long Island as well. And just thank you for being such an effective leader and advocate for, for all of them. And, and especially during the pandemic, um, let me express to you my thanks to all of your members for really providing extraordinary service during a very challenging time. Thank you. And, um, and we appreciate you coming back. You've been on our show, I don't know, four or five times. So it's always a pleasure when you come back and you give us a perspective. Um, I mean, you've been in public service since I believe you were 18 years old. So uh, you're, you're really a veteran. You started young. <laughs> So I'm still trying but, to figure out how to get it right, but thank you. Yes. <laughs> well, you know, when you figure it out, write a book and tell the, the rest of the world. So, <laughs> so I'm, I want to, I want to begin by asking you a, a question because you see so much going on with um, uh, Ben and Jerry's ice cream and now they're billboards in New Jersey uh, criticizing Ben and Jerry's. Can you walk us through from your perspective, what's going on with the controversy? Yeah, sure. So, <clears throat> um, so we'll backtrack a little bit. So everybody knows Ben and Jerry's, right? The ice cream. And and uh, before we started the interview, we were going back and forth on what the favorite flavors uh, have been. A number of years ago, Ben and Jerry's, which you know started, you know, two guys from Long Island started it and became an incredible business based in Vermont. Uh, they sold to Unilever, which is a, a, a UK-based uh, uh, company. So Ben & Jerry's is now a subsidiary of, of Unilever. Unilever is a, a, a publicly held uh, company. So uh, our involvement is in my role as trustee of the state pension fund. We hold shares of stock in Unilever. So we, uh, back in 2016, uh, adopted for the New York State Come Retirement Fund, what's what we call our policy uh, against BDS. BDS stands for Boycott, Divestment, and Sanction uh, Against Israel. And uh, parallel to that, New York State, like many other states, has a law saying the state would not do business with companies that are involved with BDS, uh, you know, on, on the theory that BDS is meant to harm Israel. Israel being a very close ally of, uh, of the United States and a strong bond between New York and Israel. For the pension fund, we're not covered by the, the state law. Our concern is the risk to our investments, right? So if, if the BDS movement would harm the Israeli economy, and we've got now about, I think, $900 million invested in the Israeli economy, is Israel companies that are publicly traded, private equity investments, uh, fixed income through Israel bonds, so anything that would harm the Israeli economy poses a risk to our substantial uh, investments there. So we monitor our holdings and, and we believe we, sh we should not be invested in companies that engage in, in BDS activity. So a decision was made by, by Ben and Jerry's to uh, uh, terminate the license that they, that they had uh, to operate in, in parts of uh, uh, the West Bank and parts of Jerusalem, and 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 under our policy, you know, broadly defining, you know, Israel and the Israeli economy, uh, we were concerned that that amounted to a BDS activity, which under our policy would mean we would restrict or divest our holdings there. So we engaged with Unilever because Unilever is, you know, the parent company, and they didn't give us satisfactory answers to our questions about how they're operating. And, and frankly, Greg, we gave them a second chance to really clarify some of their answers. They basically said, we have really nothing else to say. So we made the judgment that based on what they had represented, that in fact, the decision by Ben and Jerry's, which Unilever says is an is a independent subsidiary, uh, but, but owned by, by Unilever, we think that that constitutes uh, BDS activity. Therefore, under our policy, we made the judgment, I made the judgment as trustee, 
to uh, sell our holdings that amounted to about $111 million. Now, a number of other states, New Jersey, Florida, Arizona, I think Texas as well, uh, have taken similar actions as far as pension fund holdings. Governor Hochul announced that under the state law, state policy, New York State is evaluating uh, its relationship with Unilever as well, giving them 90 days to respond. So, so you know, the long and the short is we, we have a very thoughtful process, a very thoughtful policy based on risk to our investments. And we felt the decision by Ben and Jerry's went counter to our policy, and we felt we needed to take the action that we're taking. Thank you. And, and let, me, let me ask you, what is Ben and Jerry's reason for not selling ice cream in the West Bank? Well, I don't want to presume to speak uh, for them, but I would, uh, you know, I would, I guess it'd be fair to characterize that it gets into that larger question of, you know, what's the status of the West Bank, you know, vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinians. And uh, look, you know, separate from investment questions, obviously there are many unresolved issues and many controversies in that part of the world. But given the fact that they have been operating there for so many years, and there are other, there are other countries and territories where there are controversies and they choose not to target them for, for not, uh, you know, for no longer selling, it, it, it seemed to really be going out of their way to do something harmful to Israel, which is why we took the position that we took. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you for um, clearing that up because I, I needed to ask you that question because a lot of our listeners needed to know and they, they want to know what- Yeah, well, no, they've heard the noise about it and, you know, this, well, how does the pension fund get involved with it? But I, I really think, you know, Greg, I think it's an issue that's not going away. And, and, and you know, from my point of view, um, you know, that I think if they change their decision, you know, there's, we like to be an investor. We don't like to be a divester. So- uh, if they go back to what the status quo had been, you know, I, I think the controversy goes away. Sure. I mean, I was, that was my first question. I was going to ask one of your primary responsibilities is you're the sole trustee for the New York state pension fund. And, um, that's, this is part of your, um, duties to make sure that we have sound investments and, and you saying that, um, you just stated that because of what Ben and Jerry is doing is, is harmful to the investment. So therefore you, you can't be perceived as leaving money into something that's going to lose money. So yeah. you're, you're ac exercising your fiduciary responsibility. Yeah. You know, you've, you've been a pension fund trustee yourself. You know how important that fiduciary responsibility is something we take seriously. And even on Ben and Jerry's, you know, when people have asked us, you know, we, we have a, we've had a policy since 2016 on how to handle these kinds of questions. So this is not something that, you know, was done, you know, on a whim. I mean, it's consistent with, with our policy in this area. Yes. And, and tell us, since we uh, mentioned the pension fund, tell us how the investments are doing uh, this coming year, because I know there's, there's a, a formula if the investments make a certain amount of money it lowers the state and local taxes in the yeah. in municipalities. So tell us uh, yeah. about that policy and tell us about how the investments are going. Well, I mean, similar to, to your New York City funds, you know, we're coming off of a really good year. You know, keep in mind when the pandemic hit, you know, go, going back uh, to 2020, the pandemic closed the economy down like mid-March and, and different than the city funds, uh, our, our pension fund is tied to the state fiscal year. So we value the fund on March 31st. So from March 15th, you know, when the economy closed down to March 31st, the stock market, everything tanked. We actually had a negative year in, in, in 2020. We hadn't had a negative year on returns since the Great Recession hit. So fast forward to 2021, we had over 33% uh, return, never, never had such a high return. And similar for the city funds that ended in June, you know, uh, I forgot the exact percentage, but, but, but over 20%, uh, close to 30% uh, return. So we're coming off of a very, a very strong year. And because of that, as you point out, we were able to cut the contribution rate to our government employers, New York State and local governments throughout New York State. That's going to save them. And, and when we talk about employers, we're really talking about taxpayers. Going to save about $1.5 billion uh, by that rate reduction. So, you know, in terms of our long-term goal, you know, we've been increasingly conservative in our outlook in terms because of the volatility in the markets. So when I started as controller, we, we actually were at an 8% uh, long-term assumed rate of return. 
and we've been lowering it over the years. In fact, what we did this year uh, is lower it to 5.9%. So, so we had been at 6.8. It's, it was a pretty aggressive downward um, adjustment. We're, we're one of, um, you know, I think there are only two, two, other, two states uh, that are below 6% in terms of that long-term goal. We feel in the long run that's going to position the fund better. Um, when you lower the resume of return, you also drive up your costs. But because we had such a great year, we're able to do it in a way that uh, we were still able to cut the, the contribution rate. So, you know, in terms of where we're at right now, uh, the last quarter that ended September 30th, you know, we, we had a, it was, the markets were kind of flat, uh, you know, a slight increase. We had a really good first quarter, you know, so based on the second quarter numbers, we're, we were probably headed, if you an, annualize, we were at to about a 7% return. And even this quarter, as you know, the markets have been up, they've been down. You know, so I'm still confident long-term we're going to make that 5.9 for, you know, for this year. But, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty in the markets, a lot of concern about inflation, a lot of concern about China. You go down the long list of issues that are out there. So I, I don't think anybody expects we're going to get a 33% positive return again. But, but I think we're positioning the fund very well. The bottom line number, you know, we're big, right, Greg, as you know, we're the third largest public pension fund of the country, a $200, $268 billion fund. What's most important is how well funded are we? What, what, how, how many assets do we have for our liabilities? We're, we're 99.3% funded. So virtually a fully funded pension plan. As you know, with the city funds also having a really good year, your funded status has gone way up. It's in, in the 90 percentile as well now. So whether you're working for New York City or New York State or local governments that are part of our pension system, unlike so many other states in the country, our pension funds are, are, are well-funded. We, that promise of retirement security for our public workers is there. And, and, and the trustees for the New York City funds, my role as trustee for the state fund, and we should mention the state teachers fund as well. You know, we're laser focused on keeping the assets as close to the liabilities. And, and, and for us to be virtually fully funded is something that uh, should give our public workers and reti public retirees confidence, but also taxpayers knowing that we don't have a, a system that's uh, running out of money where you have to raise uh, the rates to make up the difference. So, you know, I'm, I'm very proud of how we manage the state fund and I'm, I'm proud of the work that you and your colleagues do in New York City, keep the New York City funds well-funded as well. Yes, and, and that's something that you were able to lower the assumption rate and save municipalities money uh, and have a record year in um, returns. Yeah. Uh, many of our public workers were on the front forefront of the um, COVID. Some got sick. We yeah. lost some uh, employees. And it's important the actions the families uh, got. Um, it's important that they get crucial retirement benefits. Can you tell us um, what the impact of the fund was due to the COVID, uh, I said, loss of life? Yeah, I know it was, it was a real challenge, especially in the beginning of this whole terrible time. Although, of course, as you know, you know, right as a union leader, we you still have members that are that are getting sick, and 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 although the numbers of hospitalizations and deaths are way down, it's it, we're not out of the woods completely. It, for our system, we've had about uh, 207 member active members who uh, passed away due to COVID, and when it was all first happening, and there was so much uncertainty in terms of treatment. And, and many people on ventilators and passing away. We worked with uh, the governor's office uh, to, by emergency order to waive the usual 15 day waiting period because you know, we didn't want someone to pass away and then their beneficiaries not be able to receive you know, the pension and instead they would get a death benefit which would be a one-time payment which generally is not as generous for families. So, you know, as well, you know, New York state law was changed, you know, for, for public workers uh, in the state and the city, you know, so the, the, the presumption as far as um, providing the more generous pensions, if you contracted COVID in the line of duty and passed away, uh, you know, that, that benefit has been there. And we've been working very closely with union leaders like yourself, whenever we hear that a member has gotten sick from COVID, we, we, we're, you know, our pension team, they're in touch right away, monitoring the situation. I mean, thankfully, you know, more people are surviving now when they get it, you know, for various reasons, we know better how to treat it. More people, 
even if they get the breakthrough uh, infection, they've, 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 they've had a vaccination, so, so they're less likely to have severe uh, consequences. But, you know, what I always say, if, 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 you're, if you have a family member, you're someone who's contracted COVID and God forbid you have to go to the hospital, you know, let your union know, let us know right away so that we could best prepare for whatever the eventuality is. So New York state law has made it more generous and then certainly the way the pension funds have been operated, we wanna make sure if God forbid a member gets COVID and God forbid passes away that the family gets the maximum benefit that, they don't, that they're entitled to. Yes. Um, looks like sales tax collection has been better than what we expected. Can you tell us about the October numbers? Yeah, I mean, we've seen this trend for a while now where, uh, you know, we're way ahead of last year. And, you know, Greg, it's an interesting question because many people say last year was so bad uh, because the economy was uh, shut down and then slowly reopened. Uh, is, it, is it really a fair comparison to say, you know, well, you're, you're ahead of 2020? Well, it is still, uh, you know, an important comparison. We're, we're up almost 13% statewide. New York City, I think, was up about 8%. What, what's significant, though, is that when you compare the numbers, we saw this not only in October that we're talking about, but September, August, you know, really the past few months. When you compare the sales tax numbers to 2019, pre-pandemic, we're ahead of 2019 as well. So to me, that's in some ways the, the, the even more impressive number is that we're, you know, we're ahead of the pre-pandemic numbers. So what that tells me is that, in fact, economic activity is coming back, people are spending money, whether that's pent up demand or you know, um, increased consumer confidence, whatever it is, that indicator of where our economy at and that's a, you know, sales tax is a very big revenue source for New York City, a big revenue source for New York State. Uh, you know, obviously for New York City, you have an income tax, you have property taxes as well. You know, property taxes have been off in New York City, you know, because of the pandemic. So the fact that sales tax is coming back uh, strongly uh, is a good sign. Certainly for New York State, it's a very good sign. And, and I should mention, Greg, New York City, which we so often say is the economic engine for the state. New York City has been slower in recovering on sales tax and economic activity generally than compared to the rest of the state. And again, New York City was hit first, was hit hardest, you know, by the pandemic. And, and although you've got some sectors of the city economy like Wall Street that's done really well, you know, I mean, I, I've been spending some time in the city now again, not just in Albany, Definitely more activity. Actually, I went to my first Broadway show the other day for the first time. Oh, you know, okay. since what did you see? I saw Hades Town and okay. enjoyed it immensely. Sure. Uh, and went out to dinner. Definitely, there's more activity. You know, so so when people are going to shows and going to restaurants and spending money, you know, starting to spend money on the holidays, I think you're going to see continued resurgence in that sales tax revenue. Uh, and I think that's, you know, that's going to be good news uh, all around. But, you know, it's still a slow process. We, we are, we're, we're better than we were last year. On sales tax, we're ahead of where we were in 2019. But, you know, overall, you look at the job numbers, for instance, you know, we, we, we're now at about a little over 56, 57 percent of the jobs that were lost. We've gotten back. We still have a lot of people that, that have not gotten jobs back. Uh, so, the recovery is 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 slower than we'd like it to be, but at least we're in a recovery mode. And and a lot of that has to do with the federal money that really has made such a big difference for us in New York. Tell, tell us about the federal money, how that come, came into play and what it's done for New York. I mean, it's really been incredible. Yeah, and in fairness, the prior administration had money to reimburse for, for COVID-related expenses when you know we were in the, the real emergency time. But you got to give credit to the Biden-Harris administration. I give credit to Chuck Schumer being our, our New York senator and our Senate majority leaders made a big difference in our delegation and in the House as well. The American Rescue Plan uh, has delivered big time for New York. So just, you know, just for New York State, New York State budget, you know, $12.7 billion for New York City budget 5.9 billion, 4.9 billion for localities outside of New York City, billions more for schools, for hospitals. I mean, it's been an unprecedented level of federal support. So that's really what has enabled 
both the state budget and the city budget, at least in the short run, to be uh, in balance. And that's good news. Now, you know, at the state level, there was also an increase in, in uh, personal income tax rate for wealthier New Yorkers. So part of why the state budget has been uh, in such balance is that that federal money, the economic recovery you talked about and the higher tax rates, you know, now compared to where we thought we were gonna be at when the budget was put together, back in April, we're like $8.2 billion ahead of where the, we thought we would be. So uh, both for New York City and New York State, it's good news. The challenge, Greg, is when the federal money will not be there, right? That money is not forever. Sure. So we have to be careful. And we, we're, we're, we've developed what we're calling a tracker, federal tracker, where we're going to update on a monthly basis on our website, how much federal money is coming in, what programs, some of the new state programs that are coming in in response to the COVID emergency tracking how much money is coming in, how much is being spent when, because I think the public has a right to know uh, how, the, how that money is being utilized and we got to make sure we're spending it as intended. But for now, it makes a big difference. The caution is the money's not there forever, so we shouldn't spend the money like it will be there forever. The assumption is the economy will continue to recover. Tax revenue will come back in. So as the federal money is spent down, you know, the economy and the tax revenue will make up the difference. But, you know, we have to be careful. You know, we have a new mayor coming in, as you know, uh, Eric Adams from New York City, and he still has some out-year budget gaps that he's going to have to contend with. So, um, well, tell us about the, the other ones. Tell us about the challenges he will be facing. Well, you know, I, I think the most obvious challenge is that, you know, the city, you know, the current administration made some decisions on on some new spending that'll be of a recurring nature, and again, the federal money is not forever. So I think one of the first challenges Mayor Adams is going to have is, is really scrutinizing the spending and see where he could realize savings to keep the budget in balance. And, and that's on top of, you know, negotiating contracts that are going to come due. The issue of public safety is a big issue out there that is very much tied to confidence that we'll, people will have in, in coming back to New York City to work and, and for entertainment. So, you know, I, I think, uh, I, I believe it's more than up to the task, by the way. Uh, but he's got to assemble a good team and do it quickly. And uh, he's got to really focus on those numbers in the budget. And, and, and you, know, you know, I've offered any help that we could provide because uh, I think people are, are, are really hopeful and optimistic that he's gonna uh, provide great leadership for New York City. Thank you. And uh, Tom, is there anything that you wanna tell us before we close? We got about one minute. Oh, I, I would just say, look, we still have challenges out there. Everybody needs to be mindful of the protocols and stay safe and well. But I also have a great sense of optimism. The federal money is a big game changer. Uh, you know, the leadership coming into New York City, I think, is focused on the right issues. We have new leadership in Albany as well. And even though next year is going to be a kind of a crazy political year, we're all working hard to make sure we get through the challenges of COVID and and do right by the citizens of, of our great state of New York. So with great labor leaders like you, Greg, I'm very positive about where we're headed. Thank you. Everybody has a position to play. It's just a, a team effort. And once we understand each other's roles, we have a common goal, we can work toward it. So I appreciate your leadership and we look forward to speaking to you again and look forward to seeing you in the future. Thank great. you. Thank you, Greg. Thank you. You, you've been listening to another edition of Reaching Out. I'm Gregory Floyd, President of Local 237 Teamsters. Our very special guest was New York State Comptroller Tom DiNapoli. Thank you once again.